Building local humanitarian capacity is an important part of Red R's strategy. And you'll have heard from, from Martin, those of you who were at the AGM earlier, that um, last year, 88% of the participants in, uh, trained by Red R um, were national staff, and 58% um, of, of, of trainees um, came from um, national organizations. And these are indicators that we use to measure our, measure our performance against our strategy. So this is an important issue for RedR, as it is for many other uh, humanitarian organisations. So that's the background, that's the reason that we've organised a panel discussion on this topic. Um, tackling the capacity challenge, empowering local actors in humanitarian emergencies. We've got um, four, four speakers um, this evening, um, and uh, <coughs> I'll be asking each of them to speak initially for five minutes, and then uh, later for two minutes. Um, uh, our first speaker is Eva Svoboda, and then Elkidia Dalum, Marilyn Mopugua, who is on Skype from Kenya, and David, and then finally David Hockaday. The aim is for us to, um, to have the, um, initially a presentation on important aspects of this topic, and then following that, um, we'll, we'll go have another round on, uh, uh, um, which is related to ways forward um, for um, involving uh, or enabling local and national actors to lead in responding to humanitarian emergencies. So, uh, we'll start um, then with our first speaker, who is Eva Svoboda, uh, Research Fellow at the Humanitarian Policy Group at the Overseas Development Institute. Eva. But local actors are in fact not just stepping in when international organizations are unable to do so. Local actors are part of the affected communities and quite often, in fact, they're the first responders when disaster strikes. They are uniquely placed to understand needs of those affected by conflict or natural disasters because of their shared history, culture, and language. So despite this recognition, the rhetoric is there, but in fact the implementation is still quite, um, quite weak. And again, I'm, I'm generalizing, and I, I recognize that there are some organizations, international organizations, that have invested a lot more, more systematically in work with, internet, with local partners than others. So if I generalize, that's kind of across the board, but if there are exceptions. I'd like to focus on three issues. Finance. Still today, only 1.6% of international humanitarian financing goes to national partners, which is very little given how much work they're doing. Um, in the case of Syria, we often found that Syrian NGOs and Syrian diaspora organizations had trouble accessing institutional fundings from Western donors, for example. There was an inherent mistrust towards these organizations because they were unknown entities. They had literally come about in 2011 and there was no track record. So it was um, institutional donors who were quite reluctant to fund them directly. Partnerships. Now the word partnership is used quite often but in fact is rarely defined. Um, we like that word in the humanitarian sector, like we do capacity building. Um, but it's important to recognize what, what it actually means and how it's understood. When we speak to local organizations, what they say is partnership for them is shared risks and responsibilities. It's partnership on an equal footing. It's not being the implementing partner of an international organization. They want to be treated as partners, be part of the decision-making process. Um, capacity building, like I said, is often used as well. What we found in our research is that capacity building is at times a, a box ticking exercise. So a training here, a workshop there, but quite often it's not really adapted to the needs of local organizations. A and again, that has been changing, but it's important that from the side of international organizations, they say what they can offer, and from local organizations to clearly define what they need in terms of, of support. Support is also needed in terms of um, ensuring that local organizations have the moral, financial, and other support they need um, to operate in high-risk areas. 
We often assume that local organizations are safer, that local staff are safer by definition because they come from a particular area. It's a false assumption. Most of those aid workers who have been killed um, are local staff. Um, local organizations bear the brunt of that kind of violence. What is needed is training, how to assess safety. What is needed is financial support when something does happen, such as um, an insurance, for example, to look after families. That's not yet done quite systematically. So to conclude, um, I believe if current conflicts, such as Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere, are kind of an indication of what conflicts will look like, we will need to invest a lot more in that kind of partnership with local organizations. And it's, for me, not a question of either or, either international organizations or local organizations. There are so many, the needs are such that it literally needs all hands on deck. And the question is, who can best respond to particular needs? Now, that might be sometimes an international organization. That might sometimes be a local one. Sometimes they might have to work together. Um, that also requires a frank dialogue on objectives, on affiliations, on you know whether humanitarian principles are are, um, are respected. So it requires a dialogue, but it also needs long-term investment, and that is not quite yet done, uh, I'm afraid. So and I'll conclude there. Thank you very much. We'll have questions at the end. So um, I'll go straight on to El Khadir Dalu, um, who is an international development and relief worker. I don't think the, the question I, I, uh, I have been asked to tackle is, is the challenges in the relationship between the local actors and the international actors. And here, I do not want to put the challenges all in relation to the international actors. There are some challenges related to the uh, lo uh, local actors themselves. There are some challenges related to the international actors, and there are some challenges related to the environment and the context where both are uh, uh, operate on that. And for, for me, and, and I think a number of uh, colleagues probably here in this room, that especially who are uh, adopted uh, uh, right-based programming, those who are adopted right-based programming, there are three pillars to that right-based programming. One, we call it direct action. That is just basically the input. And the second one is change of policies and promotion of best practices. And the third one, which is the topic of today, is strengthening the capacity of local institutions. Whether these local institutions are civil society organizations, or a private sector, or a public sector. Those are the local institutions are interested to, to do the response of the humanitarian response. The challenge, if I were to talk, the challenge is how serious the agencies and how consistent the agencies who are the international actors in the uh, capacity, in their commitment in strengthening the capacity. Basically, we are talking about making ourselves redundant. Are we really making ourselves redundant by, by empowering those local actors and to play that? And as I think I can, say, I can give an example that it plays at best in India after the earthquake, 1997, I think, or something like that, the, the biggest earthquake in India, that that earthquake, because the, the relationship worked very well, the Indian local institutions, they played everything. And the international actors, they only brought the technical know-how and the finance. Apart from that, it has been done brilliantly, the response, and everyone, and, and, and if you go for a number of evaluation, that has been done very brilliant. So that is one example when the agencies are very serious about that. But the, the, if you are talking about humanitarian response, during the humanitarian time, it's going to be very difficult if you are talking about building the capacity. Building the capacity in the post-humanitarian, in the post-crisis response. That is very important. And if you look for the tsunami, when the tsunami hit, you will find many agencies bombarding the areas affected by the tsunami, and therefore it's going to be very difficult to work that. But it, ha it should have been before that. If you are talking about the earthquake in Haiti, if you are talking about the Ebola in, in West Africa, if you do not have a, a, a capacity that built before that, at the time, you will not be able to say, I will go that. So I think that is one about the seriousness of the agency. The second point I would like to focus on is about um, the comparative advantage. There is a role that the international is not about 
us versus the local versus the internationals. The international bring a comparative advantage. The local bring a comparative advantage. But when do you, you go to the local, there is a private sector. There is a, 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 a public sector. And there is a com, uh, civil society organization. Each one will bring certain merits. Are we playing to the strengths, to the full strengths of all the actors? That is, that is, a, that is a, a serious question. And this question will lead me to the next challenge. It's about, um, is, is about uh, creating a conducive environment for them. And here, there are three issues you need to take care of. One, in any country, and especially the country I come from, there is something called regulation. And the regulation is the NGO Act. This NGO Act, is it favorable for the local actors? Is it favorable for the, for the international actors? Because this will shape the relationship between, between the different actors. And this is really very challenging uh, in, in, in a number of countries. For example, when you have an authoritarian regime, you will find it is more of control. And if you have a regime that really think about this is something that they need to do, they play a role of a facilitator. I would like to see a regulator and a facilitator, combination of regulator and capacity. Regulation because you need a discipline, accountability, you need a framework that people need to work on. But the most I, I would like to see 90, yellow, 90 percent, that is means one, 90 percent you need to focus on the facilitation issue. And that is the challenge in number of places whereby we lead, we lead us to, to the second, then it leads us to the countries asking for nationalization. They say, we need to nationalize the humanitarian response. You cannot nationalize the humanitarian response if you have not enough sufficient capacity. And also, they lead it to being cynical of international. I have seen that in Somalia. Somalia, the internationalists in Nairobi, you talk to them, they are so cynical about the, the Somalis, forget about it. They are not going to do anything. And the Somalis, ah, look at those people who are in Nairobi, they are enjoying the safari and everything and so forth. And, and this relationship, it doesn't go any, any, anywhere. Because it, 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 it really doesn't take the... Uh, and that is one of the core issues that uh, people need to discuss about. You don't need to be cynical about each other. You need to, need to look at the comparative advantage. And, and that is um, uh, very important. So. And, and, and I'll conclude here, in, in, in this challenge, one of the things I found that if you are serious about building the capacity of the partners, are you serious about building the capacity of your own national staff as an agency? <coughs> Charities start at home. And that is very critical because those national staff, it doesn't matter whether they stay with you or not. This is the asset that in the country and could be used for a future response and could be moved in the future. And that is also a challenge, and I found a number of organizations that, that, that they are not dealing with this challenge as it should be. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much. Your timing was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our third speaker, I hope we can get through Skype, is um, Marilyn Mabugua, who is um, Red Eye UK's Interim Country Director for the Sub-Saharan Africa program, based in Nairobi. Uh, thank you, Ian. Maybe what I could start is, uh, someone would you be able to put up the map? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, um, what I'll do, I'll just start with a brief introduction. Uh, well, the Red Eye uh, UK Kenya office has been in, in existence since 20, 2011. And it actually started as a support office for the South Sudan country office when it was still an East African regional office. But from that time to date, it's grown, become a Kenya country office, an East African regional office, and now we are a Sub-Saharan regional office. Uh, we have a strong uh, team of local trainers uh, that's, uh, who we train with over here. And uh, we, and uh, like this presentation is going to draw on our experiences in two projects, that's the Kira project and the Fizim project and a bit of info, which we have been running for the past three years. Uh, Kira, just maybe to let you know, is a Kenya interagency rapid assessment, which is a combination of both uh, the rapid assessment and the disaster risk management. So it has two components under that. 
So some of the issues I'll be addressing uh, in challenges that uh, we face in strengthening capacity of local and national actors is, uh, well, the two projects, Kira, DRM, Info, one of our focus has been to actually focus a lot on the national actors, try and build the capacity of the national actors both at county level and at national level, uh, and that was one of the things that we had done. Uh, we've, we faced a, a number of challenges, I could say if I could just give broadly, getting the right people in the training. Under this we have issues of budgets. Uh, what we have seen as the Kenya, uh, um, Kenya office is that a lot of the local NGOs, local CBOs have budgeting challenges so that when we're down at county level and we want to go and offer them training, uh, one of the things we tell us is they don't have a budget, a, a budget line for training and capacity building. Uh, and so they're, in, they're very much interested in, uh, in, in actually attending the training, but they just don't have the funds to actually attend the training. So one of the ways we did was under the project is we actually went and provided free, free trainings. And this we did under the Kira and the Kira and Info too. Uh, it proved very successful. And I think that was, I think, one of the ways we were able to mitigate that. The other challenge, I think, I would say is outreach. I think, like, if you see on the map, um, if you check, like, the northern part, Kulkana, Marka Beach, Mandera, Wajir, uh, Samburu, West Pokot, Isiolo, those are some of the, like, some of the counties that we have been working in. A county like Marsabit, you see, which is, like, at the top of the, the uh, Kenya, is a very big county. So one of the issues we face is that we have a lot of local NGO CBOs who are very enthusiastic. They want to come and, and, and attend the training, but they just don't have like the transport or the means to get to the nearest uh, location whereby we would be um, having the training. Uh, so uh, again, it comes down to budget lines. And so what we did under the project is we were able to come and, uh, and, and say that if you're able to get your participants to the training venue, we will reimburse you on your transport and accommodation. This is something that is contrary to Red R, but I think it's one of the ways in which we have been able to mitigate and just to be able to get the commitment of the participants uh, at county level. Um, again, uh, like getting the right people of the training, sometimes uh, the CBOs, NGOs, uh, as well as county governments, like when I'm talking about this, I'm also including the county government staff. A lot of them, because they hear it's a training, it's by an INGO, they think that there's money involved, per diem, the issue of subsistence, so they will rush to come for the training. Uh, as you're aware, Red Army have a policy whereby we don't give out per diem. So sometimes this, this creates an avenue whereby you miss out on getting the right criteria of participants because uh, people have got misconceptions of what they are hoping to achieve by the end of the training. How we've been able to mitigate this is by working closely with the national government to inform their local government down at county level and their local partners. We tell them this is what we are coming to do. Uh, so it has worked and uh, we've seen that we've been able to actually try and mitigate that. Um, uh, again, uh, the other issue I would say is effectiveness of training. Uh, on this, I will talk about the training design, the contextualization, and language barrier. Uh, one of the challenges we had under the INTO project was we were focused mainly in the DAB refugee camp, in Kakuma refugee camp. For the DAB, some of the agencies who are INGOs, because of the need that they want to prove, that they want to assist beneficiaries who are local refugees who are under the employee. Uh, they would come and say, oh, come and provide training for our staff. And uh, after a lot of discussion, by the time we get to the ground, we have found in several cases that some of the participants are not very well conversant in English or Kiswahili. They're probably only fluent in Somali, so which initially created a problem, but we were able to avert that by just ensuring that one of the, the group who is uh, constant fluent in the other languages would sit by them and provide translation services. Uh, this, is, this is despite uh, a lot of communication back and forth with the agencies, telling, uh, just asking them, are you sure that your group is fluent in English or Kiswahili? And they would reassure us, yes. But I guess uh, one of the reasons is because they're so eager for 
uh, to try and uh, provide some capacity building for their beneficiaries, like they're not like completely honest or open with us. Um, the other challenge I think has been like like when we were doing the intro project uh, again because we were mainly focused in the DAB and given the security restrictions in the DAB, we have not been able to reach out to the local NGO CBOs who are based in the DAB because of security restrictions. In this way, focus of only for focus of NGOs NGOs. Uh, we've tried to request the INGOs, NGOs to invite their partners to come and attend uh, the trainings because the trainings are actually free, they're fully funded, and it's for benefits to everyone. We haven't been very successful, especially in the case of the DAB because of security, but uh, for Kakuma, because security is uh, a lot more, like Kakuma area is uh, a lot more secure, we have been able to actually target and manage to, to train local NGOs, CBOs, and county governments. Marilyn, I, so, I'm showing you the yellow card here, uh, oh. <laughs> which means, which means uh, can you finish in one minute, please? Okay, I was going to say I've actually ended. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excuse, excuse me interrupting. <laughs> but thank you, thank you, Marilyn, um, uh, and, and the various practical points that you made there, which are very interesting. And then our, our fourth speaker is um, David Hockaday, who is transition manager with the Start Network. I'm going to try and build on a few points and maybe uh, emphasise a few points as well. I want to start off by saying. This is incredibly complex. Uh, we spend a lot of time debating capacity and what capacity means. In fact, there's a few people in the crowd tonight who, um, who we have these conversations with. Um, we spend hours on this. It, it's, I mean, there's many things to talk about. There's skills, behaviours and competencies. That's fairly well understood. Uh, that reside in people. And we often talk, when we talk about capacity building, we talk about training and workshops and people. And that's good and that's important. Um, I also feel that capacity resides in organisations and systems as well. There's an organisational element and a systemic element. Um, capacity is also information, ideas, services, products. It's also time and it's of course also money as well. So we've got all of those things in a pot. Okay, so bear those in the back of your mind when we, when we carry on here. There's something else as well, and I hope to get a bit of time later on to talk about this. Capacity also resides in relationships. It also resides in partnerships as well. And I want to talk a little bit more about the relational economy later if I can. The other thing to say is that capacity can also be invisible. Um, just because we cannot see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Um, uh, the anecdote I have around this to try and explain the point, I spent some years in, in South Sudan. I remember once um, being in a location around Rumbek and there was a, a boy in the field and he couldn't have been much older than five years old. And, we went away for the day and I came back late and he was still there in the evening and I got a bit concerned and I said to my local colleague at that time, there's a boy in the field, is he okay? And the guy said to me, it's fine, he's looking after the cows. And I remember thinking at that point, I saw a lost boy in a field. Actually, that boy had a lot of latent capacity. He was looking after a herd of cows and, and you'll know how hard it is to look after a herd of cows as a pastoralist, right? Um, if I gave my five-year-old a herd of cows, I had, heaven knows what would happen. But the, the, point, the, point, the point is, it's just because we can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. And this is really important. Um, we, the point, I guess, is that we don't have the time or necessarily the inclination often to understand delicate local ecosystems. Um, but we have to in order to understand where best and how best to invest. Capacity is also extremely dynamic. Uh, local capacity contexts are constantly changing. Market forces bring new services and capacities to ecosystems all the time. I'm going to use that word quite a lot, by the way. I know some people don't like it, but I'm going to use it. Um, they also make capacities redundant. Uh, local labour markets change all the time as a result of, of, uh, of interventions. But the question is, are we aware of our impact in this regard? So much good local capacity is poached by NGOs and this can have a detrimental effect. And I want to talk a little bit about this later in relation to the, 
the Charter for Change that CAFOD have circulated recently. Capacity is also very political. Uh, this is for me is a major issue. So the concept of shifting the power, we talked a little bit about this, brings us quickly buffering up into ideological conversations about the nature of power, where it resides, who has it, uh, and what are they using it for. For national actors to take a leading role in humanitarian response, there has to be a realignment of expectations. If we own it, then they don't. Okay, and it, but then the question is, how adaptable are our business models? When I say our, I'm talking about INGOs here. How adaptable are our business models? What does relinquishing control actually look like? And how would it affect the organisational DNA of INGOs? These can be threatening conversations to have. And now, Fadir, you talked about this earlier. You know, if we are serious about working ourselves out of a job, then what does that mean for our organisational business models? So to me, this is one of the biggest challenges we face. We're currently stuck, and I believe this, we're currently stuck in a, a political or what we call a crisis economy. This is an economy that's perpetuated by the resources, um, or perpetuated and resourced by the existing multilateral system. It's this which largely determines the capacity that's currently available and the organisational behaviours that we see. This economy is typified by reactive and short-term investment, which drives the projectization of humanitarian aid. So this political or crisis economy is typified by the delivery of aid and compliance and log frames and outputs and results and all that other stuff that gives us nightmares and headaches. There's a huge body of work out there, and I'd encourage you to look at this, that details the damage that this can do. Can do. It's a, um, a study on USAID, and it's uh, on uh, developmentscapacity.org. Check it out. There's some great work, great work on that. The political or crisis economy is also dominated by a small competitive and insular group. According to a recent IRAN report, 1% um, of humanitarian agencies control over 70% of the available resources. That, to me, doesn't sound like a very healthy ecosystem. As well as insularity, there's also a problem with the amount of funding. With less than, I think your stat was 1.6, I've seen varying amounts, but um, according to the report I saw, less than 0.3% of ODA channeled to national NGOs over the last few years. Now, bearing in mind the total humanitarian aid economy is worth slightly less than the global bubblegum economy, um, and, and, and slightly much less than the global yogurt economy, that's, uh, that's barely a few sticks of bubblegum. What's worse for a sector that prides itself on accountability is that we don't actually know the real figures because there's no obligation to report on them, and even if there were, there is no agreed way or standardised way to collect the data. So how can we improve on this? when we're not, and cannot, even measure it in the first place. The other thing is the type of funding. This is also an issue. Aid is productized, as I've already said, and it does not allow strategic or transformational development. There's also a problem with the way that we approach partnership. A technocratic approach to aid means we focus on creating mini-me's. We homogenize, rather than uh, the transformational effects we want to try and achieve. We kind of created a codependency environment, a worse still, a Stockholm syndrome, where the very people we want to support and help are actually trapped by our support and help. There are obviously principles of partnership which were agreed back in 2007, and one of my suggestions later on tonight might be that worth revisiting these and opening up new conversations. I want to conclude very quickly by saying then I've outlined uh, three or four challenges associated with this attempt to shift power. That's notwithstanding conversations about what power is. That's for a different session and a different uh, conversation. So the first point, our ability or will to truly understand the local context and ecosystem before investing. Secondly, our ability to recompense local actors when we poach their best people, we being the international system. Thirdly, the current political or crisis economy that drives organisational behaviour, and I would argue for a... For developing and investing in different economies, relational economies and preventative economies, and I'll talk about those later if I get the chance. And then linked to this political crisis economy, A, the amount of resources currently available are not enough, we know that. B, the type of resources. And C, competition for resources. And lastly, D, the, the, the approaches to partnership we adopt, adopt within this current economy. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.